Patricia Grass, welcome to Passion Time. I'm here with Amanda Brock. She is highly respected around the world for her knowledge of water. Um, she's been voted top 10 women in energy by the Houston Chronicle. Um, she is the founder and CEO of Water Standard, a uh, water treatment company and focus, which focuses on energy and, uh, and in the industrial sectors. Um, it's great to have you here. Thank you. And, and obviously your passion must be water, but I'm gonna ask you that. What is your passion and how are you living your passion? So passion is water. Um, it is about water and all the things that touch water, which really is everything. How am I living it? Um, I grew up in Africa. I grew up, I was born in Swaziland, but most of my childhood was in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. And as a little girl, when I was home from boarding school, we had this huge ficus tree that was on the Interliquid River. And I would go down at night and at night the hippos would come out, the crocodiles would go away, the animals would come drink, people were fishing, and we'd sit in this big ficus tree and I would just dream about that whole world that was outside of my little world and think about how the world worked. But the one thing in being in that environment was water was life. And when there were droughts and no crops, animals and people died. Our crops failed, we were ranchers. And so I always had this feeling if there was a bigger world out there, but water somehow was that fundamental element that held it together. And of course that is so self-evident, but as a little girl, I just knew water was so important. And I also just knew that I had to do something around it. I didn't know where my life's journey would take me, but I knew it would involve water at some level. But you, uh, did you study chemical engineering? What no. Was your, what was your background With all of that, this is what's so crazy, is I spend my life with engineers, and I spend my life in the energy industry and, and the water industry. I'm a lawyer. That's right, you're a lawyer. So, so yes, how, a lawyer. how do I get to how this? How did button? that happen? Yes. You know, you grow up when you want to be different things, and um, my father used to say to me, you, you're just going to argue the hind leg off a donkey. <laughs> and it just sort of slipped into law. And, you know, law was a good ground for me, provided me with um, the ability to really think um, through problems, great sure. negotiating oh, yes. skills. Yes. And um, I did that for a while, Vincent and Elkins here in town, and then left um, and went on the business side and took those skills with me, but spent my life with engineers and, you know, just that's the route it took. Now, I'm fascinated because I, I, I understand we can't call them inventions, but you have patents. We do have for, patents. For different desalination uh, discoveries that you've made. Yes. I don't know how much you can share about that, but that's a very important um, discovery because what I hear, and of course you have to tell me since you're the water expert, is that we eventually will run out of water. And we need what you're trying to do now so that we don't have those problems later. So the outlook for water is bleak, yeah. particularly in a time of climate change. And we don't take it seriously enough. But we truly are looking at a bit of a perfect storm of, you just look at human numbers. Um, in 2014, 7 billion people. In 2050, 9 billion people. We can't sustain this. And the one thing is, how do we make more water? Right. Because if supply, if demand is going to outstrip supply, we have to find water somewhere. We can conserve, and we must. We can reuse, and we must. But the sheer demand for more food, more energy, more of everything, and you look at all that nexus, you need more water. Desalination is drought proof. You are able to create more water from water that is otherwise not potable. We can't drink it. Right. In Texas, we live a wash brackish aquifers. Right. The ocean surrounds us. So desalination, the mechanism pursuant to which you remove salt from water so that it becomes usable, has been around forever. It was used by sailors. So we haven't invented desalination, but what we have done is take that process and think about using it in a different way and encourage the use of desalination. What we focused on, and I have a tremendous team, and our CTO is just frankly brilliant, is to look at diesel and take it mobile. In other words, either through modularized systems, which you can put offshore or you can take into drought areas, or putting it on a vessel, putting it on a boat, 
making water as you go wow. and delivering water when you get there. So those are primarily our patents. And then because we are at heart environmentalists and we are stewards of this world, even right. though we are making such right. a mess of it, the one we, we are, I agree. The <laughs> one thing um, to also consider is that when you desalinate, you now have a super salty brine that you have to get rid of, and a lot of people focus on that. So a lot of our patterns relate to how you discharge that brine, salty okay. water, back into the environment in a more benign way that it doesn't have a negative impact on marine life. That's what you're working on right now. That's what we have done. And then what we did is adopt a lot of this technology into the oil and gas field. Okay. So to really focus on cleaning produced water offshore before you discharge it into the ocean. And so we have taken that water knowledge into oil and gas and the industrial sector, which is where we are focused today. How important is it to do that? Because I understand most people don't, don't get that. When you are working with uh, the oil industry, water is such a huge part of it. You know, a lot of people don't realize um, that the energy companies, the oil and gas companies, if they truly think about it, they say we're water companies. What people don't realize is that globally, for every barrel of oil that is produced, between three and seven barrels of water are produced. Wow, wow. So you can argue that that's a new water source because the technology exists to clean that produced water that comes up okay. to the level where it can be used for drinking or for agriculture, a beneficial okay. use. But hu huge quantities of water are produced in oil and gas extraction and throughout that chain. And so not only is water critical to produce, produce oil, oil, but then you get all this water when you produce it that you have to deal with in some way and you can't just dump it. And that's where you you have to treat it. And that's where you come in. That's where, where we come, come in. in. That's correct. Now this is a very broad question. It has, it has to do with water in general. There are areas of the world where people are, are fighting over water. There are. And it could cause major wars. So the, the UN Security Council now has water in its mandate. And think about that. We think about a Security Council, it now has water because water touches social, medical, it touches food. And you can't live without it. And you, can't, you can well, live without oil, but you can't live without water. Without water, we die. Yes. We don't have to have it originally. We, we die. Yes. And without food, we die. To have food, we need we water. Need water. So it is so fundamentally important, and we've abused it so much. And when you look at shared watersheds, you look at rivers like the Nile, you've got Sudan upstream of Egypt, you look at the Middle East, Jordan, Israel, you look at um, Iraq, Iran, you look at all these flashpoints where water can become a defining moment in people's decisions as to how they will go. I mean, wetlands have been destroyed to make people move. That was, that was in Iraq. Um, it is frightening what we can do. A very interesting thing was said to me by a vice admiral after the Haiti earthquake. He said, when we go in, the first thing we do is we set up where we're going to distribute water. People will find that out and people will move to us. Because they need it. Because that is the it. first thing they need. So where they set up their water distribution system will cre create this natural forcing mechanism to bring people to a place. Now I can either ask you what your next project is, or I can ask you what you want your legacy to be. Because you are a water expert and you know how important this resource is. I want my legacy to be that in a careful way, helped people realize that while water is a fundamental right, it is a commodity that we have to value and price in order to drive good behavior. So changing the model and the way people think of water and the way people price water and incentivize reuse and conservation, I want to be a part of that group of people who are making unpopular statements. Um, we have to protect the all people who need a certain level of water to survive. Right. 
But after that, we need to drive behavior. And that always, unfortunately, in this world, is through pricing water in a different way. All right, Amanda Brock, thank okay. you so much for joining us. It's great to have you. Thank you very much. And thanks for watching. And thanks for watching. And we'll see you next time on Passion Time. Cambia tu vida. Cambia tu vida.